Okay, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce today's speaker for the National Science Seminar, Mr. Robert Cabral. Robert has two passions. They are martial arts and dogs. Robert has a, he's a third degree black belt in Okinawa and Karate. So if I were you in front row, be careful, right, you get hurt. Uh, but he has taught karate for a number of years in his own dojo and also for the sports club LA. Uh, Robert works as a bodyguard for high profile celebrities and dignitaries. Uh, but then Robert took what he learned for, in martial arts and started applying it to his other passion, which is dogs. So he became an expert dog trainer. And then Robert founded Bound Angels, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to saving abandoned dogs from potential destruction. So I thought, Robert came to my animal behavior class about three weeks ago, right? Yeah. And we had a great time at Alumni Park with his dog, Goofy, and I decided to invite Robert back again to speak to a, to a broader crowd and talk about animal uh, intelligence and emotions in animals, uh, in dogs and other animals. And I thought it was uh, great that Robert has taken his two passions and created his personal vocation, which is saving dogs. So let's welcome uh, Robert Cabral as he... Uh, uh, let me just say one more thing, that uh, usually we have a question and answer session at the end, but uh, Robert is welcoming questions as they arise. So if you want to ask a question or make a comment, please don't hesitate to do so. So let's start out, who here has a dog? <laughs> Everybody. Almost, oh, you don't. Okay, that's okay, we'll, we'll get you one. <laughs> so if you don't have one, we can get you one for free later. Um, and th so thank you, first of all, for wel welcoming me and just sharing a passion for animals. I mean, all of you here have a passion for animals. You're studying it, you have dogs. Um, you have a desire to learn how to communicate with a species that's not us. And that's very strange. So if you look at the coevolution of, of canines and humans, which is really the wolf and the ape, it's a very strange coevolution. So we would think naturally that we would coevolve with a species like an ape that's more closely related to us, but we don't. We've actually evolved, coevolved with a species that's very unlike us. Walks on four legs, doesn't speak, doesn't have the same facial structures or anything like that. That coevolution, like I talked about in the other uh, sp speech I did, really helped us become who we are. There's studies that have shown that without our coevolution, we would have been stymied in our growth and our development and our abilities. So that's a really exciting thing. And understanding how to communicate better with dogs, like everybody's dog here can probably sit, right? If you tell them to sit, they sit. Maybe you tell them three or four times and they sit. <laughs> By being able to communicate in our language, to them, they understand our intonations and what we mean by those intonations. So if I say sit, or if I say pit, or dip, it still has that same intonation, and more than likely, if you tell your dog to sit in that manner, it will sit all the way through. But if you change a little piece of it, and you sit down and face your dog behind you, I would bet $10 if you tell your dog to sit, and you're not looking at him, and you're sitting in a chair, your dog won't sit. So try that as an experiment. Somebody's, next time somebody says, my dog's really well trained, go up to the dog and say, sit. And the dog will sit and they say, see, he's well trained. Say, great. Then let the dog run around, lay down on the ground in front of the dog and say the same word, sit. And I bet you 10 bucks he won't sit. Because dogs are conditioned a certain way. Many dogs will learn to sit in front of us, but they won't learn to sit next to us or behind us. So what I'm here to talk about today is intelligence in animals and dogs and other animals. But we're going to talk mainly about dogs because we'll use them as our role model for all animals. But we've proven in science that dogs can be more easily trained and conditioned through things like pointing, eye movement, than even apes. So even an ape, in an experiment, if you watch a great program on Nova called Dogs Decoded, it shows that if I take a dog and sit him in front of two cups and underneath, each, under, underneath one of the cups is a treat and I point to that cup, the dog will go to that cup. So pointing is a sign of not only intelligence, but problem solving, but it's also a sign of communication, of trust and respect that they will follow this lead from us. 
So when we point to the cup, the dog will go to the cup, knock the cup over, and get the treat. An ape won't. So that should tell you about the difference in intelligence between the two. Now, you can, you, many of you have seen the documentary on Coco, the, the gorilla that could sign language. Right? So that's another skill that an animal was taught. There's a dog called uh, Chaser, the Border Collie. You can look up Chaser. Chaser knows a thousand words and knows um, inflections, knows um, directions and everything. So in other words, I could say to the dog, stapler, and the dog would see that that's a stapler. I would say, bring stapler. And the dog could take the stapler and bring it to me. Right? But I could also show the dog a two-dimensional photo of the stapler and the dog would still understand that's a stapler, which is a very, very far leap from a solid three-dimensional object to a two-dimensional object. The dog would also understand actions. Stapler, touch stapler, and she would touch the stapler and come back. Paw, paw stapler, paw the stapler and come back. It's a fascinating study on canine intelligence and relationships. The person who trained her, I believe, was a, a psychiatrist um, and really spent hours, five to seven hours, every day training the dog. Sadly, we don't have five to seven hours every day to train a dog, but if we did, we could, be, we could, make, we could create another chaser. So, um, first part is intelligence and emotions in animals, and we have to define, first of all, the most important component, what is intelligence? Anybody raise your hand and just tell me your a definition or, or what you think of when you think of the word intelligence. Don't, don't all jump at once. What is intelligence? What, what, how do you define intelligence? Okay, receive information. Anybody else? How about solving problems, right? So we can receive information, but how we decipher the information, how we process it, and what we do with that process is huge. So the idea of intelligence is using the, the ability to solve a problem. For example, a problem that you might have is I need to go to the restroom. So I need to know how to open that door, how to look for a sign that says restroom, and I can solve the problem by going to the restroom. I can solve the problem that if this is in my way that I can say, okay, I'd rather put this there. I can solve the problem by saying I'm hungry, so I can take a fork and eat a salad. Or I can kill a rabbit and eat the rabbit. Right? So basic problem solving, like you'll see dogs that will dig for food. Right? They, may, they may burrow for, a dog, for an animal that's underground and get that, or they may chase a squirrel, and they may do these things, which therefore uses intelligence to solve a problem. How is that beneficial to us? Because if we look at the intelligence of an animal, or of a dog to solve a problem, a dog to run after a rabbit, or a dog to uh, lay down and do whatever to be comfortable, how do we use those tools? And that's the main topic that I want to talk about today, because intelligence not properly used is just as good as ignorance, right? If you use your intelligence for nothing, there's no benefit to the intelligence. You could be the smartest person in the world, but if you live in a cave, you're not helping yourself or society with it. And that really, in, in the greater good, has to be the goal, is to help other people with our intelligence. Yes? How would you compare intelligence to just instinct? Okay, so that's a very good question. How would I compare intelligence to instinct? First of all, intelligence is solving an overall problem that I'm faced in order to get to a conclusion. Instinct is the idea of just a natural action. So a natural action of something's coming at me and I move out of the way. Um, is the instinct which has probably been developed through intelligence would be um, I can chase a little cat but I can't chase a mountain lion. Right? So one involves solving a problem that brings me to a result. The other one, instinct, is just a natural ability that has developed and is, is almost second nature to us without really problem solving. Yes, Professor. I had a similar question to that, but because it seems to me that if, if a dog chases prey, mm -hmm. uh, that that would be instinctual. Mm -hmm. But I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, but I. There are multiple levels of intelligence, right? Correct. And there are multiple levels of problem solving. One of them, I think it's called insight. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, some scientists have done experiments with chimpanzees where they maybe hang a banana yeah. out of their reach and provide boxes Stools, for yeah. them. And see how long it takes for them to figure out if they can stack the boxes to right. push the banana. 
have there been similar experiments with dogs to see if they can have insights? There, there have been some, but they've been mainly developed because of the difference in you know, the, 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 the grasping of hands and things like that, where dogs can't do s certain things like we can do. So they've, those problems have always been addressed where can the dog knock over the cup, can the dog go into the right position and stuff like that for the reward. But yeah, those, those studies have been done. There were some recent things um, that I saw where they actually um, did MRI studies on the dog's head during things of like pleasure and pain to see how they process the information, which is also really fascinating. I think it was on 60 Minutes. So, um, so how we use that intelligence to our benefit is yet another piece, right? So if we look at a, an animal, and every animal has emotions, right? Give me two examples of an emotion. Yes? Um, sadness when they're gone. When sad. their owner's gone. Okay. Animals show that. But that's a conditioned emotion. That means I'm sad when they're gone. But sadness in itself is an emotion, right? Very good. Anybody else? Any other um, emotions? Happiness? Yeah. Anger? Right? Now, when these emotions develop is really important to understand. So if we look at certain emotions like excitement and arousal, um, distress, contentment, fear, those, those behaviors are all conditioned in humans before six months. Right? And the very first emotions that are conditioned are excitement and arousal and distress. So if a baby's hungry, he's in distress, he cries, he screams, he acts up. When he's aroused and happy, he smiles and does the happy baby. Right? We all know that dogs generally, they say the smartest dogs function at the level of a two and a half year old child. So if we want to kind of process that information that where these in green, these emotions, and there, and there are several more, but arousal, distress, contentment, fear, and love come into a dog's being or in consciousness and when they start to understand those and develop those is before two and a half years in a human, which means they would be in the dog's scope of, of, of ability. They can, they can process these. Now, other emotions that come in much later, like after two and a half years, and maybe some as close to four years, would be contempt, guilt, pride, and shame. Those are developed emotions that usually are based on experiences, right, or how, how animals feel. And we have to look at this whole scope, um, and the gorilla trekker in Rwanda said to me when I made a mistake with a gorilla and almost got, got hit, by the gorilla, not the trekker. Um, he said, Cabral, you were a very naughty, naughty man when you took the food from the gorilla. No, I was a very stupid man when I took the food from the gorilla because I didn't mean to do it. But he said, the gorilla sees us as another animal. He, you know, the, the differentiation between humans and other animals, we have a caste system. In other words, we're humans, and then everyone else is an animal. It's a very, very poor way to look at life, right? We're humans. We're, we almost don't consider ourselves animals. But yet we are animals, just like other animals. We just have developed, in some ways, a higher consciousness, a higher intelligence than some animals, or we think we have. But all those tests are based on tests that we have developed, right? There was a really great um, book that you should read called Ishmael. And I don't know if you, has anybody read it, Ishmael, by Daniel Quinn? Yeah? I mean, it's a fantastic, it's one of my favorite books, and there's a book on tape that um, gives insight to, I believe it was a gorilla, right? It was a gorilla who was caged who actually talked to this man and explained how man sees himself as the final evolution of animals. But yet, if you talk to an alligator, the alligator is the final evolution of animals, or a shark, or a gorilla, or whatever. And we kind of look at this very myopically, that we think because we're forming the tests, we're forming the scholastic approach, that we're the most intelligent, but we're not, right? We are the most intelligent in what we have professed to learn and teach, but we're not the most intelligent in the overall scope of things because animals have better ways of solving many, many problems than we might have, right? And you can just, I'm not gonna give any examples of that because none come to my head, but if you think of the ability that animals have and through their development, it's, it's a greater scope than we might have just in our things. Now, we're great at developing tools and, and using these things to solve our problems, but there's plenty of problems we're not solving. 